church at Philippi is an interesting church in a very interesting place. Now, we've been looking at Paul's letter to this interesting church for a few weeks now. And I don't know if you remember, but whenever we got together the first time and began our journey through this book, I kind of gave you a little bit of a background, a little bit of a history, not just about the church, but also about the colony, the community, the city of Philippi. It's a very important place, a place of great strategic importance. But you may recall that I shared with you that the church at Philippi, or the community of Philippi, was a Roman colony. And I also highlighted for you that there were two ways for a place to become a Roman colony. The first, very simple, very straightforward, you were a colony started by the Roman Empire. If, if the Roman Empire gave birth to you, settled that place, then you were just naturally a Roman colony. The second way, the way that the city of Philippi became a Roman colony was far less frequent and far more strenuous. In order for a colony or a city to become a colony of Rome, they had to be grafted in. And in order to be grafted in, they had to demonstrate a long and faithful practice of being fully Roman. They had to strictly adhere for a long time to Roman politics, to Roman customs and cultures, to Roman forms of entertainment, to Roman social conventions, and yes, especially Roman religion. The city of Philippi was Roman long before it was officially Roman. And they had a great deal vested in keeping that practice and keeping those policies in place. They were finally one of the few select chosen to be grafted in. And it was something to be proud of. And it was something to hold on to. So here comes this church at Philippi. This church that Paul had planted and this church that had flourished. And they could not, because they were a church of Jesus Christ, they could not sign off on certain Roman practices. They could not engage in Roman forms of entertainment. Roman politics might not have always flown with conventional Christian orthodoxy. And they certainly could not and would not adhere to Roman religion. So lines were drawn, and the more successful this church became, the more problematic they became for the community. If this church ultimately succeeded in Philippi, the community, the city of Philippi, would fail because they could no longer be Roman. This put not just the church, but the individual believers in Philippi in a very difficult, precarious situation. On the one hand, they were citizens of that city. But on the other hand, they were citizens of a more eternal city and kingdom. So you could say that the believers in Philippi had a dual citizenship. And believe it or not, whether it is Philippi in Europe or whether it is Princeton in Kentucky, all believers still have this dual citizenship. So this morning, what we're going to do is we conclude the first chapter of this letter. We're going to look together at the simple subject of citizenship. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, looking down through verse 30. Let's take a look at God's word. We are told in Scripture... Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you 
that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Thus concludes the first chapter of this letter. Paul didn't write it with chapters. He didn't write it with verses. But we kind of come to an unofficial conclusion of sorts in this letter. And in this unofficial conclusion, there are three things that I want to highlight for you, things that hopefully will help you see the need for and also the ability to be a good citizen. The first thing that we need to see is this. Number one, citizens of earth and citizens of the kingdom of heaven must have a united stance. Now, look, I understand. I, I've been in the preaching pastoral game long enough. All right. I understand. I get it. When it comes to speaking about unity in church, it's like talking about bipartisanship in Congress. It's a nice idea, but nobody really expects it to happen. I mean, when a pastor gets up and, and talks about how the church needs to be unified and needs to be one, people will amen, nod their head left and right, say great sermon. That's what we need to hear. I get it. While we want it. And while we know we need to have it, none of us, if we're being honest, really anticipate it because we're people and people are different. People have different views on a host of things and a host of subjects. But while unity might not be the norm and while unity might not be expected, it is nonetheless spoken of. Numerous times in the New Testament, constantly over and over and over again, churches are being called to unity. Think about what the Bible says in verse 27. Look at what it says. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. Now watch this, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, real quick, I, I won't belabor this point, but, but just notice the wording of that text. Notice some of the language that Paul uses. Standing firm with one mind, striving side by side. When you use, we don't use the word striving a lot today in modern language. We, we just don't. We've we found other words that we use. But, but when you think of striving, you're, you're striving. What does that mean? It means you're working. It means you're laboring. It means you're battling. To strive is not always pretty. And it's certainly not always easy. And listen, I am not going to tell you and I'm not going to tell any believer or any church that unity in the body is easy. That it won't come without work. That it won't come without some bruised egos and hurt feelings. But nevertheless, we are told to strive for this. One mind, one spirit, side by side. Now, we don't live 2,000 years ago. And we don't live as a Roman colony. But in the Bible times, they had to be unified. And the reason they had to be unified was because quite literally, they were all that each other had. The, the citizens of Philippi, the officials at Philippi, no doubt this church was on their radar. Ah, uh, they, they're not going to say Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. They're, they're not going to offer offerings to Caesar. They're, they're not going to go into the Roman temples that we have set up here, sprinkle the incense upon the fire altar, and adhere to the Roman practices of religion. They're not going to do that. These people are weird. They, they call one another brother and sister, even their own spouse. They might be incestuous. 
They, they have this meal regularly where they talk about eating some guy's flesh and drinking his blood. They might be practicing cannibalism. We can't trust these people. That was the press that the early church got because the culture just didn't get them, just didn't understand them. So they had to have one mind. Not, not, not about politics, not about foreign policy, not about the tax rate, not, not about any of those things. They had to have one mind for the things of God. And even then it wasn't easy. They had to strive for it. They had to work for it. Because in spite of all of the work and all of the striving, and all of the sweat, being unified was worth it. And it still is. Listen to what the Bible says later in this book. We'll, we'll do a deeper dive into this later. But Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Our heavenly citizenship requires that we be good citizens here on earth. We adhere to the laws of the land so long as they not infringe upon our Christian faith. A 55 mile an hour speed limit does not keep me from practicing my faith. We adhere to that. Paying my taxes does not keep me from practicing my faith. We do that. As much as possible, we conform ourselves to the laws of the land. And we always, whether we want to, whether we like them, or whether we don't, we always pray for our officials. Because part of our heavenly citizenship is being good earthly citizens. But we must never forget that for those who are born again, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, our citizenship, our true citizenship is in heaven. We have dual citizenship, but we don't have equal citizenship. And as citizens of of heaven, we must be united. Not only that, there's a second thing. Not only do we see that there needs to be a united stance, there is also in this text a refusal of fear. Paul planted the church. He knew the culture that he was planting that church in. He knew the politics. He knew the vested interest this place had in being Roman. He knew that. And he knew that there was going to be tremendous pressure put on this church and on this people. But he called for a refusal of fear. Now understand something. A refusal of fear is not always a good thing. And oftentimes, if someone is unafraid, they're simply at times unaware. All right? Think about this. A few years ago, I was driving home to my house there and we were getting close to pulling into the driveway. I had a few of my kids in the car. I don't know how many. My kids, it doesn't really matter. I had a few of them, all right? But I know that my youngest son, Isaac, was in the car. And as we came around the curb approaching our house, I noticed that our two worthless outside cats were down very, very close to the road. And our house is up off the road, so, so it just wasn't common for them to be down there. And I thought, that's odd. But as I pulled up, the sun was setting, it was getting dark, but as I pulled up, I began to realize why they were down there. Those cats had a snake cornered. And, and I pulled into the driveway, and as soon as I got close, the cats scattered, and, and I stopped just right next to the snake because... It's a snake. I wanted the kids to see it, point it out to them, maybe have a little bit of a teachable moment. I said, hey, guys, look, there's a snake right there by the car. Isaac, who was no more than four at the time, said, I want to see, hopped out of the car and put his foot six inches from that snake. A snake that had been cornered, was amped up and ready to strike. It was dark, couldn't really tell what type of snake it was, but he had no fear. Why? Because he had no knowledge. 
He, he didn't know where his foot was going. He didn't know what type of snake it was. And because he didn't know, he had no fear. That's not good. That's, that's not good. If you're unafraid because you're unaware, that's not good. But there is another refusal of fear. A refusal of fear that comes not because you are unaware, but because you are very aware. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 118, verse 5 through 7. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Isaac wasn't afraid of the snake. Because Isaac didn't know to not be afraid of the snake. The church at Philippi was not afraid of the culture, of the authorities, of the empire, of anything. Not because they were unaware, but because they were very aware. They were aware that whatever may come and whatever may happen, they were aware that the Lord was on their side. God is on my side. What will man do unto me? You see, when you have that knowledge, an accurate knowledge of truly who God is, and the fact that he is on your side. What can anyone do to you? What can anyone do to us? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So there's a united stance. There is also a refusal of fear. And finally, our third and final thing, there is a willingness to suffer. Now, the Bible is going to say something that I, I'm not going to say you're not going to like it, but at the very least, you might not really relish the idea of it. But before I read what the Bible says, Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite heroes of history, when writing his defense of the authority of Scripture, said this. Within the scripture, there is a balm for every wound, a salve for every sore. Oh, the wondrous power in the scripture to create a soul of hope within the ribs of despair and bring eternal light into the darkness which has made a long midnight in the inmost soul. So the Bible is going to give us a balm, a salve of hope in what I'm about to read. Look at verse 29 and 30 of the text. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. <laughs> so, notice, notice the wording of that scripture. <laughs> Guess what, guys? It's been granted to you to suffer for his sake. Like, that's, that's not the language I would use if it were me writing scripture. Thankfully, it's not. But, but I would have said it something like this. Got some bad news. Stinks to be you, but do your best. You're going to suffer. 
the way the Bible words it. It's been granted unto you to suffer for his sake. This, this past week, I got to thinking, trying to chew on those words, granted to suffer. One of the great names that we can call God through, through the work of Jesus Christ and him reconciling us to God, one of the great and very overused and underappreciated words that we can refer to God as is Father. So just think for a second, all right? Any father worth his salt will suffer for his family. Not because he likes to suffer. Not because he likes the toll that it takes and the heartache it creates. Not because he's into that type of thing. Any father worth his salt will suffer for his family, not because he loves to suffer, but because he loves those for whom he is suffering. And if he knows he is suffering for his family, there will even be a sense that he is glad to do it. Because he values them so much. It's been granted to us to suffer at times. Not because we like to suffer and we like the pain but because we love the one for whom we suffer. An awesome verse of Scripture. A really stinking cool verse of Scripture. One that I just love so much is Acts 5, verse 40 and 42. Uh, the church in the book of Acts, it basically had two good chapters, and then after that, troubles come. All right? Ananias and Sapphira, all of this stuff takes place, and the authorities begin to sniff them out. Well, they, they, they've got some of the apostles there, and they're having this big discussion like, what, what do we do with these guys? People are starting to follow them, so we can't be total jerks. We can't kill them, but we can't have them doing this stuff. So what do we do with these guys? Well, they, he, he, here's, here's how we find all, all of that playing itself out. Acts 5, 40 through 42. And when they, the council, had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, wait for it, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So they went away beaten and threatened. That's a bad day. All right? I don't care who you are. That's a bad day. But they went away rejoicing. Not because it happened, but because of who it happened for. We rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer. To suffer for the name. The church at Philippi, they were citizens of Philippi. Philippi was their home. Their, their childhood friends were there. Their co-workers. Their, their grandparents. Their mothers. Their fathers. Their sons. Their daughters. Brothers and sisters. Aunts. Uncles. All of that. All of that was there. Philippi was their home. And for their home, they were making some problems. If Rome found out that this colony that they trusted and grafted in could not control their population, it could be bad. It 
could be bad. But the believers at Philippi and the believers in Princeton and the believers all over the world must say with the apostles of Acts 5, 29, we must obey God rather than men. You're a citizen here in this place, in this city, in this community, and wherever you're watching from, you're a citizen there. And you have responsibilities to that place. But if you have been saved through Jesus Christ alone, your citizenship is in heaven. You have dual citizenship, but not equal citizenship. And when it's all said and done, we must obey God rather than